Turn with me to Matthew 5. I'll be there in just a moment. On your handout, I've just um, placed a little bit of review there at the top last week. We began, uh, actually it was two weeks ago, so even more need for a review, right? Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the background to the Beatitudes. And so uh, we asked, what are the Beatitudes? As we approach them, I came up with a definition that, um, I don't know if it's, it's helpful, probably has the word kingdom too much, but um, hopefully that, that a focus gets through. The king's pronouncements of favor upon kingdom citizens who exhibit kingdom qualities and enjoy kingdom promises. That's what the Beatitudes are. And, and as, we, as, we, uh, as we look at the Beatitudes, I think it's helpful. Um, there's some summary points by Martin Lloyd-Jones that he provides uh, that help us to, to know how we should be reading the Beatitudes. Uh, so you have them on your handout. All Christians are meant to manifest all of these characteristics. In other words, it isn't, it isn't some people uh, that are gifted with some things and some are gifted with others. This is for um, all Christians are meant to manifest all the characteristics. And secondly, all Christians are to be like this. This isn't just a special um, group of Christians, a, a description of some really exceptional believers. Thirdly, none of these descriptions refer to what we may call a natural tendency. Uh, if we really understand what these qualities are talking about, um, we'll find that they're not um, characteristics found in non-believers. And then fourthly, um, these descriptions indicate the essential utter difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. You could say that the descriptions, these descriptions show that Christ, Christian and the non-Christian belong to, to two entirely different uh, kingdoms. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of, of Jesus Christ. But if you'll remember with me, uh, as we talked about, the Beatitudes are given, they're given to those disciples who have committed themselves to follow Jesus. Um, but there's also these, uh, the crowds that are listening in. They're, they're kind of on the perimeter. We find that at the end of the, of the, um, of the Sermon on the Mount. And so while this, this message is really directed towards um, believers, it's also an evangelistic message because Jesus knows that some of them who hear it, who hear this message, um, they don't have these blessings. So they're being invited to repent and enter the kingdom. And the first beatitude that we're studying today is essential for entrance into the kingdom. You have to be poor in spirit. Let's go ahead and read the passage. Matthew 5, uh, we'll just start in verse 1, go down to verse 10. Seeing the crowds, he went up and he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This past week, I was um, on a playground talking to a four-year-old. Um, it wasn't my son. And uh, this boy is really uh, outgoing, and he just started telling me all these things. He started talking about his family. And I don't know how we got on the topic of finances. Uh, but at one point, uh, it's always dangerous when you talk to a little kid and they start volunteering information about their family. Uh, at one point, he said, they're going to give my dad $50. And I don't know why they would give him so much money. He doesn't even really work that much. <laughs> uh, I kind of cut him off, you know. Uh, it, I was kind of really shocked by this... Uh, this information that was given to me, this, uh, this statement. But today, we're going to talk about, about what God has given us, how it is so much, and how it is not something that we worked for. We're going to talk about spiritual poverty and the blessings of spiritual bankruptcy. But we need to begin by asking the question, what does it mean in verse 3 to be poor? What does it mean to be poor? Poor. 
And before we answer that question, I want to just take us to a passage in Luke. Can you turn to me, with me to Luke chapter 6? Start in verse 20. Um, passage 20 through 26. The, this passage in Luke 6 um, has a few similarities to Matthew 5. And there's also some obvious differences. I'm not going to read through the whole passage, but um, just to give a word of explanation here, those differences uh, probably indicate one of two things. Either Luke and Matthew are recording the same sermon, and they're kind of highlighting uh, different parts of that sermon, different ways, or um, they're actually recording two different sermons with similar content, which I think is probably more likely. Have you ever heard of an itinerant um, like traveling evangelist who preaches some of the same sermons? Uh, the fact is, Jesus is speaking throughout the region of Galilee, and so inevitably, a lot of his content is going to be similar, though presented in a little bit different fashion. So I think that's what we have here. Now look down at, at one of the differences in this particular sermon. Luke seems to kind of place a focus on the physical and not just the spiritual. He says, blessed are you who are poor, not poor in spirit. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. He continues, blessed are you who are hungry now, instead of you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For you shall be satisfied. And then down in verse 24, he says, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So when Jesus uses the word poor, is his primary focus, is, is it really on financial, on, on physical lack? What do you think? When we look at the word poor throughout the New Testament, it is primarily used for um, the financially, the economically poor. In Matthew 26, the disciples were, they're, they're angry, they're indignant when they saw costly perfume poured out on Jesus' head. And they say in verse 8, why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. In Mark 12, 42, it says, a poor widow came and put two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. The word definitely is referring to physical poverty. But it doesn't stop there. <clears throat> Jesus even seems to make this connection between those who are materially poor and those who enter the kingdom. Let me show you. In Matthew 19, Jesus is talking to a young man who wants to know what he must have, what, what he must do to have eternal life. And after Jesus gives him a few laws, and he says, I've, I've kept all of these laws and and he says, what do I still lack? Which is kind of ironic because Jesus is about to explain that it's not what he lacks, but what he doesn't lack. He says in verse 21, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And after the man goes away sorrowful because he had great possessions, Jesus, he presents this staggering statement that, that shocks the disciples in the verses following. Um, verses 23 and 24, he says, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel, like, like one of the biggest mammals that they would know in that day, um, in that area, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God startling statement. Then you have Luke 16, where Jesus tells the parable of the dishonest manager, and he concludes with these words, you cannot serve God and money. He doesn't say you, you can, you, that you need to keep your, your, kind of your love for money in check. He says you cannot be servants in two kingdoms at once. You're either a citizen of God's kingdom, you're serving money. And Jesus continues a few verses later with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And in verse 25, Abraham says to the rich man who's suffering in torment, Hades, child, remember that you in your lifetime receive your good things, <clears throat> and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. The man who was once rich is in torment, while the beggar is in paradise. And let me show you one more passage. Can you turn to James 2? Verse 2, <clears throat> I think it's important to just read this. James 2, verse 2. 
It says this. For if a man <clears throat> wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor, a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves, become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Why did I read all those passages for you? Am I suggesting that you have to be poor in order to be saved? No, of course not. (laughs) Then why do we have all these passages that seem to point to riches keeping people from the kingdom? I think it's clear that Jesus thinks riches can be a stumbling block for people entering the kingdom of God. Matthew 13 says that like a thorn choking a new plant, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches can choke God's word in a person's heart so they don't bear fruit. Riches can be a threat. But why? Is wealth the problem? No. Riches are not inherently the problem. It is the the spirit of self-reliance and pride that often accompanies wealth. Proverbs 16, 19 puts this together when it says, it is better to be of lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. So ultimately, the problem is not money. The problem, though, is pride. It is a lack of brokenness, your sense of neediness. You don't have to be physically poor to enter the kingdom of God, but you do have to sense your spiritual poverty. So if we want to just make a few conclusions at this point about about physical wealth, the first we can make is that the Bible says it will be harder Uh, not impossible, but more difficult for those who are materially wealthy to sense their own spiritual poverty, their own neediness. There are many, uh, you know, there are many godly men and women who are are very wealthy, but have not had pride to go with it. Incredible examples um, such as Selena Hastings, uh, William Borden, William Colgate, there's there's many others like this. Incredible stories, you should look up and read, but um, but it will be more difficult for those who are materially wealthy. And secondly, um, at the same time, just because you're physically poor doesn't mean that you automatically recognize your spiritual poverty. There are many people who are they're physically poor, they don't have a whole lot, but they still have not repented and placed their faith in Christ because what they really want is, is to keep their sin um, and add Jesus into their life if, if it means he'll rescue them from their physical poverty and make their lives better. Just because you lack material wealth doesn't mean <clears throat> that you will have humility to enter the kingdom of God. And I think thirdly, we might conclude that there's, there's great hope for those that don't have much. Eternal life and a relationship with God is not based on your social status, how much money you have in the bank. So whether you are poor or rich or somewhere in between, ultimately pride is, is the threat, not wealth. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, I think is a great verse to keep on um, maybe the front of your checkbook or <clears throat> to read before you check your, your financial portfolio. Consider before you make a, a big financial decision. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, proud, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. There to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. There to do good, to be rich in good works. Before we continue, why don't we just take a moment right now and pray individually. Ask God to help us, God would help us to be rich in faith not to chase after physical wealth. Would you do that with me? Just bow right now and and pray that God would help us to have the right view towards riches.
Okay, let's jump into it. We've talked about what it means to be poor and how that impacts entrance into the kingdom of God and how it doesn't. Uh, but let's spend the rest of our time focused on poverty of spirit. What does that mean? Um, you look back at the first beatitude. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is talking about those who are, <clears throat> they're spiritually bankrupt. So what does it mean to be spiritually bankrupt? Spiritual poverty. Does it mean you don't have God's spirit? <laughs> no. Does it mean you lack, you lack energy, physical weakness in a person? You know, poor in spirit. No. I would say that spiritual bankruptcy, being poor in spirit, refers to the state of your honest self-awareness before God. Spiritual bankruptcy refers to the state of your honest self-awareness before God. In other words, it's, it's a recognition of your desperate spiritual condition. In order to receive salvation of the Lord, first you have to recognize that you need saving. There are dozens of passages that show us that God chooses to save those who cry out to him with a humble spirit. Psalm eighteen twenty seven: for you save the humble people, but the haughty eyes are brought down. You bring down. Psalm 76, 9, God arose to establish judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Psalm 149, 4, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. You cannot have a revived heart without a humble and contrite heart. The word contrite means, means crushed, to be beaten to pieces. So have you ever come to the point of honest self-awareness before God where you saw yourself before him who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy? Have you seen yourself before that high and holy one? Have you ever fallen on your face with a spirit that's crushed, desperate for him to save you? Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 says, Heaven, Lord says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So many of you can, can remember when you realize the first time your neediness before God. You realize your desperate need for a savior. Maybe you, you trembled before his word while you're reading it or while a preacher shared that from, his word, from the word. So this morning, you're listening, hopefully, and, and maybe you're even thinking of an unsaved friend, someone that, um, maybe it's a family member, someone that, that has not humbled themselves under God's mighty hand. You're thinking, they need this message. And if that's you, then let me ask you a question. Are you still poor in spirit? It, is it possible to be saved for years, maybe even decades, to raise godly children, to serve faithfully in church, to have Bible degrees, maybe, you know, Greek and Hebrew, <laughs> hundreds of verses memorized, and yet to think of yourself more highly than you ought. The fact is, the closer we get to our Savior, the more we learn about him, the more clearly we should see our spiritual poverty. Have you ever tried to wash your car in the dark? Or when it's getting, when it's getting dark? It's really hard to see the, dark, the dirt when it's dark, Right? Um, you, you finish washing in the morning, you're like, oh, great, I missed all these spots. I, I've done that a time or two. The closer you get to the light, the more clearly you can see how dirty things really are. C.S. Lewis said, it is when we notice the dirt that God is most present within us. This is the very sign of his presence. So do you notice the dirt this morning? Would you turn with, um, to Revelation 3 with me? <clears throat> Revelation 3, 
Um, verse 17, we'll read that together. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking about the church at Laodicea. He says, For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. And I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The fact is, these, these Christians were, were physically wealthy. Uh, Laodicea was known for their banking, their medical school, their textile industry. But Jesus says, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. He's talking about their, their spiritual condition. In their spiritual poverty, they are wretched, pitiable, because they don't recognize what state they're in. The verse says, not realizing that you were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. If you remember the, the parable of the prodigal son, you'll remember that moment when he's in the pig pen and he finally, it says, he came to his senses. He realizes that he is in poverty. We might use the word destitute to describe his situation. The realization that the prodigal son had to come to is the same realization that the Laodiceans were lacking. There are believers, children of God, that view themselves as rich, when in fact, they're poor. They think of themselves as having eyes to see, but they're blind. They view themselves as clothed and put together, but they're naked. Last Sunday evening, <coughs> um, Pastor Tim uh, taught a marriage workshop for the couples, GBC, and one of the main points that he was trying to get across was um, that the, the beginning of change is brokenness. And I don't know about you, but um, it's not uncommon for me to, to hear a message, um, hear someone teach, and then, and, and to say in my heart, I, yes, that's true. And then to, to walk out without really considering uh, what that truth means for me. Um, that's what I did last Sunday night. I affirmed everything that Pastor Tim said, but I don't think it really sunk in until Monday night. Um, I had a, a conversation with Suzanne, and she shared some, some things with me that, that kind of revealed a need for growth. And God used my wife to show me how spiritually bankrupt I really am how much I desperately need God. And then God used my, my son to do the same thing. On Tuesday, I was in the boys' bedroom and one of my sons acting very foolishly, um, injuring his brother. Um, and I spoke with words that were they're filled with frustration. My son, he, he turned to me and he said, Daddy, that was, that was wrong anger. And he was right. So what does God have to do to expose our spiritual poverty and our need for him? When are we going to come to the place where we stop seeing ourselves as pretty good Christians in comparison to everyone else and start realizing that whether poor, we're blind, we're naked in the presence of a holy God? I'm sorry. How many of you have heard of uh, Jim Elliott before? He is... Um, one of my favorite heroes of the faith, Jim was one of five Christian martyrs who gave their li lives in an attempt to, to reach the Alca Indians in Ecuador with the gospel. And if you ever get a chance to read the journals of Jim Elliott, you'll discover that Jim had this incredible zeal, love for the Lord. Um, he lived with this purpose and conviction and dedication to God. And yet on October 3rd, a few days before his 21st birthday, Jim Elliott wrote these words in his journal, heavy and sorrowful because of my coldness insincerity and fruitlessness. Oh, how needy, ashamed to meet, uh, sorry, oh, how needy, what emptiness I feel. I'm not ready to see the king in his beauty. I should be ashamed to meet him this night. The Savior, Savior's words come tenderly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
Blessed are those who, who feel their spiritual need. The question this morning is not, are you poor in spirit? The question is, do you realize your spiritual poverty? Do you realize that you are poor, spiritually bankrupt? Spiritual bankruptcy refers to the state of your honest self-awareness before God. And, <clears throat> and although that's, that's the essential first step, that's not, it's not just enough to just recognize that you're needy. You have to do something about it. So what do most people tell someone who's, who's living in poverty? What, is people usually, what would people usually tell someone that's poor? They say, get a job, right? Get to work. But that's not the application here. Because you cannot work yourself out of spiritual poverty. You cannot do enough good things to build up spiritual credit. If we go back to Revelation 3, we should see ourselves as blind and naked. We are beggars before God. We have nothing to offer. The application is to realize your poverty and then cry out to the Savior for mercy. One last verse here before we, we conclude. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Thank you. <laughs> we keep sniffling up here until someone brings me one. Use my mic. Oh, <laughs> mute my mic. <laughs> Second Corinthians 8, 9. As for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus left the riches <clears throat> of heaven to come to be born in a low-income household. Jesus said the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was stripped of his clothing on the cross, but the poverty that's being referenced in 2 Corinthians 8-9 is not these parts of physical poverty. On the cross, Jesus took your spiritual poverty in order that you might be made rich with his perfect righteousness. If you've never really seen yourself as a beggar before God, and admitted your spiritual bankruptcy. I plead with you to do that today. Maybe you've been living your whole life as a Christian, and you've never been broken before God. Trust in Christ, who's provided the greatest transaction the world has ever known. Enter the kingdom of God today. And if you've done that in the past, you're a believer, perhaps many years ago, um, you did that. Don't be puffed up with pride. Realize that humility for God is, is, is talking about, the, the phrase poor in spirit is something that we continue for the rest of our lives here on earth. If you want to think about it this way, we'll close with this. The, the closer you get to the king on his throne, the lower you bow in humility. Because the closer you get to his throne, the more glorious and perfect you see him to be, and the more wretched and pitiable you realize that we are. The third verse of Rock of Ages says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. <clears throat> Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to thee the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. <clears throat> Father, you know that we are poor. We're needy. And yet most of the time we we think that we have everything put together. We look around and we we say not too bad. And Father, we need to be broken. Would you use your spirit today to work in the hearts of your people and perhaps those that have thought that they're your people, your children, and have never actually fallen on their face before you. God, we praise you today for your mercy that you choose to use the weak. We thank you for Christ.
the perfect example of one who, who had no lack, but who, and spiritually, but he, he chose to put everything aside physically and in order to make us rich spiritually. Father, would you help us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God this morning for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.